This is an ordinary Japanese home. But every day it produces something extraordinary. I'd like to introduce you to my lunch. This is a bento box. Now, it's said that in Japan you eat with your eyes. It's really, really important to appreciate the appearance of what you're about to consume. And what's more, this bento box even carries meaning. Its theme is Japan's favorite season, spring. So these little things are cut into the shape of cherry blossoms, and there are a number of vegetables, including this rape blossom, that only come out in the springtime. So this little bento box is almost like a work of art. It's got technique, it's got form, it's got meaning, it's got symbolism, and it's almost too beautiful to eat. In Japan, much of domestic life is informed by aesthetics. The home itself can be a work of the imagination. And many of the activities that take place inside it are performed with precision and grace. The modern world was thought to have destroyed the ancient Japanese art of life. But beauty still abounds. As artists reinvent these old traditions for a new era. But the Japanese house has also influenced the West. It helped create modern architecture as we know it, and transformed how many of us live today. Japan has a population of 127 million people. It is one of the most densely inhabited places in the world. And the vast majority of people live in endless cities, in small flats. But it wasn't always like this. A hundred years ago, 85% of Japan's population lived in the countryside, and they had done for centuries. Most of their rural homes are long gone. But a few remain. Miyama is one of Japan's last surviving traditional villages. And these are Minka. Vernacular houses once lived in by most of Japan's people. These minka might look rustic, but they're actually an amazing piece of technology designed to combat the extremes of the Japanese climate. The thatched roofs are steep enough to wash away the heavy summer rains and the winter snows, and the buildings have been lifted off the ground to create as much ventilation as possible during the hotter and more humid months of the year. And Japan's geography even dictated the way they were built. One of the defining features of this village, and indeed much of Japan's traditional architecture, is the abundance of wood. It's absolutely everywhere. Now, there are at least two reasons for that. The first reason is that wood is plentiful in Japan, while stone, which is mostly volcanic here, is too hard to build with. And the second reason, and this is a little bit morbid, I'm afraid, is that on the whole, wooden houses are safer. Yes, they're more likely to burn down, but they're less likely to crush their occupants in the event of an earthquake and easier to reassemble in its aftermath. But though Japan's traditional house builders took up woodworking for practical reasons, they very quickly turned it into an art form. In fact, Japanese craftspeople pioneered a consummate form of carpentry unequalled in the West, and were able to construct whole houses without screws, nails or glue. Just ingenious techniques. 
These techniques are still in use today here at Nakamura Yoshiaki's workshop in Kyoto. Nakamura is one of Japan's most respected Tsukiya Daiku, or master carpenters. To become a Tsukiya Daiku, one must master a complex code combining ethics and practicalities. It's even present in the way a carpenter uses his tools. え、いわゆる向こうから旦那と手前へ引いてくる。それでどこ切りも、向こうから手前に引くように、どこの刃になってます。ヨーロッパ、欧米の道具は押すっていう全く逆です。マッチも一緒ね。で、あなたたちの町
The owner's main residence was a fortified castle filled with armaments, but when he wasn't working, he'd come here to his fantasy home. This was his refuge, a place for contemplation and aesthetic reflection. But looking at it today, you know what I find most striking about it is its modesty. At exactly the same time, European rulers were building these vast Baroque palaces, and this, by contrast, is so humble. In fact, the only outward sign of extravagance is the second story, which was almost unheard of in Japan at the time. It's clear where this house got its inspiration. The low eaves, the wood, the way it's raised up from the ground. It refers back to the Minka of Japan's rural past. Refined and elaborated. But the real beauty lies inside. It is influenced by the simple aesthetic of Zen Buddhism. And it contains all the ingredients of the traditional Japanese interior. The rooms are open plan and free from clutter. The exterior walls are shoji screens whose paper surfaces infuse the home with soft, otherworldly light. The floors are tatami, rice straw mats that dictate the size and proportions of every room. But the most important feature of this house is almost invisible. It is a unique Japanese concept known as ma. Ma is of fundamental importance to Japanese aesthetics and its way of life. It refers to the negative spaces between things. The most obvious example of ma is silence. If I were to pause midway through this sentence, we might find it unsettling. But in Japanese thought, that gap, that interval, is just as full and just as full of meaning as the words that surround it. Now, ma appears in many Japanese art forms. It appears in painting and calligraphy, in drama and in martial arts, but it's also present in Japanese homes. And Rinshin Kaku is full of it. Just look around and you'll find negative space everywhere. Rinshin Kaku's floor plan is endlessly flexible. Partitions slide behind one another to open up the rooms. Even the outside walls are movable. The effect is one continuous space, and it extends even to the outdoors. Light, functional, versatile, Rinshin Kaku is a lesson in domestic design. And houses like it have profoundly influenced modern architecture in the West. In the work of architects and designers like Frank Lloyd Wright, Charles and Ray Eames, Walter Gropius, and Le Corbusier. When modernist architects and designers first encountered traditional Japanese houses, they were astonished. As far as they were concerned, this was modernist architecture that just happened to be hundreds of years old. And of course today, open plan living, minimalist interiors and clean, simple lines have become the very principles of 21st century living. But those principles were pioneered centuries ago in houses like these. Amid all this minimalism, 
One place in the Japanese home was reserved for extravagance and was dedicated to decoration. It was known as the Tokonoma. It might look like an empty recess, but this alcove was once the heart of the Japanese home. The owner of the property would sit here and was therefore framed by his tokonoma. But his tokonoma would also be the stage set for some carefully selected objects. The tokonoma would include a scroll, often with calligraphy. and it would be joined by a simple floral arrangement. Which had to be just so. Because this was an art form in its own right. Ikebana. Many Japanese people are obsessed with flower arranging. Because ikebana is not only a hobby, but a highly personal form of expression. A popular art form of domestic life, there are over 1,000 Ikebana schools in Japan today. But its origins lie in religion. It started here at Shionzan Chōhōji Temple in Kyoto. In the 15th century, it was the home of a Buddhist monk called Senke Ikenobo. Ikenobo was responsible for arranging offerings to the Buddha. And he was particularly enamoured of flowers. On the 25th of February, 1462, Senke Ikenobo made a very special flower arrangement. It was a complex freestanding construction of about a dozen different flowers in a golden vase, and it was replete with symbolism. Now, apparently, it caused something of a stir. In fact, the people of Kyoto flocked to the temple simply in order to get a look at it. We don't know exactly what the flowers looked like, but Senke Ikenobo did leave us some clues. This is a really quite special document. It's a five metre long scroll that dates back to the 1480s, 1490s. Now, for years, it was locked away and hidden away from sight. Its contents were known as the secret transmissions and were passed only from one master to the next. Even today, no one's entirely sure of its exact meaning. But this part of the scroll seems to offer us a glimpse of the very earliest Ikebana creations. They are, of course, beautiful drawings and they're perfectly preserved. But what's so fascinating about them is the text around them reveals how each one of these arrangements served a different function and captured a different moment in people's lives. So this one on the left is called a farewell flower. It's an arrangement you make when you're saying goodbye to a family member or a friend or a colleague. And this one on the right is pretty much the opposite. It's called a waiting flower. And it's something you make when you're waiting for a loved one to return. And this final arrangement, this was made to celebrate a young person becoming a monk. There is still much to be learned from this document, but I think it makes clear that Ikebana was not simply flower arranging. It was a subtle and elusive medium that was all about expressing the joys and the hardships of life. And over 500 years of history, practitioners of Ikebana 
have attempted to master it. This is Manabu Noda. He may look like a bank manager, but he is one of Japan's most respected Ikebana masters. Students come to Ikenobo from around the world to see him work wonders with flowers. Ikebana というのは kado という呼ばれます。花の道というんですが、道というのは終わりがないんです。ですから私があと何年イケバナをお稽古してもですね、完璧、パーフェクトにはなりえないんですね。イケバナの場合は、そのもちろん美しい作品、えー、アレンジメントを作るんですけども、その仕上がったアレンジメントの出来栄え以上にお花を生けてる時間、その時間というのが一番重要。こう目に見えないものがマナーですけども、まあ、我々の生け花で言うと枝と枝との空間。実は私たちはお花を生けると言いながら、そのお花が一番美しく見える間をお花の周りに、えー、作り出していく。ここを重要視しています。季節というものは移り変わっていきます。常に変わっていくということが日本の文化の中で大切にされていることですので、それを花を生けることを通して人間も同じであると。生きているということは常に移り変わっていく、変化していく。日本のいわゆる和室だと床の間に飾ってその床の間の花を媒体として人と人が触れ合うことになりその生けた花を通して見る人と生けた人の、まあ、コミュニケーション触れ合いにもなるわけですね。Very specific guidelines about looking at ikebana. You position yourself here, one tatami mat back from the tokonoma, and it's very, very important that you are face to face with the arrangement. You can't be looking at it from the sides. Anyway, once you have your position, take a breath, compose yourself, and then you can begin to look. And you have to begin by looking at the very base of the arrangement. You're looking specifically at the point at which the plants first emerge from the water. Now, that's a really, really important part of Ikebana. It's known as the Mizugiwa, the water's edge. And that is the origin of life itself. Anyway, once you've meditated and reflected on that, then you begin to raise your head and follow the line of the plants upwards and upwards. And upwards until you reach the very top. And when you reach the very top, take another breath, and then you can begin to appreciate the arrangement in its entirety. It consists of three plants Japanese iris. Spirea and green maple. They've been chosen because of the season, reflecting a specific moment when late spring turns into early summer. The composition of this piece is absolutely fantastic. It's all about visual harmony. So there's harmony between the different colors, between the purples and the whites and the greens. There's harmony between straight lines and curves. And of course, there's also harmony between positive space and negative space, between the flowers and the ma that exists between them. This is known as a shuka arrangement. Now, shuka in Japanese means living flower. And this arrangement really does chart the life story of a flower. We see how at the beginning it emerges from the ground and shoots upwards. It then gets affected and bent by the elements, by the wind and the rain, but it continues its journey nonetheless. 
So there is a real sense of a life story taking place here. And I love this allusion to different stages in life. So two of the irises are blooming quite beautifully, but another one is still in bud. And in some ways that's even more important because that is about the future. That is about hopes for the future. You know, I never thought I'd say this, but it really is quite moving to look at this arrangement because while on the surface, it is all about the life story of a group of plants, it's impossible not to reflect on our own lives too. The journeys we have to make, the hardships we have to endure, and of course, the transience of life itself. Who would have thought that a group of flowers could contain so much meaning? But Ikebana is not simply floristry, it is a domestic art form, full of style and symbolism. And it's not alone. In the traditional Japanese tokonoma, Ikebana is accompanied by a hanging scroll. This often contains another of Japan's great ancient art forms. Calligraphy, or Shodo. Shinochoji is a quiet neighbourhood not far from Kyoto. And this is the home of one of the rising stars of Japanese calligraphy. Every day, Tomoko Kawao practices for three or four hours, copying great works by history's Shodo masters. To create each character, there's a set order of strokes. A pattern that hasn't changed for millennia. まず書道の一つの特徴として、え、最初から書き始めから書き終わりっていうのが道をたどることができる。気持ちで、こう筆が激しく動いているとか。150年前にはみんながこう筆を持って書いていた時代があるんですけど、スマートフォンだったり、タブレットだったり、もう全部デジタルで全てデジタルで全て手で文字を書くっていうことがすごく貴重になってきて、その先人の人たちが作ってきた
ぜ書道が人の心を表すのに適していると言われているかというとこう自分の心の動きが腕の動きとして網に表現されるからだと思います。から心がそこにあるように見えるからだと思います。二度書きができないっていうのはあの書道のとても、えー、重要な。とところだと思っていてい、えー、とても潔のいい、えー、そ,このそこに全神経を集中して作品を一瞬にして作る。Tomoko's painting reads Shu Ha Ri, a traditional phrase which describes the stages of mastering a form to learn, to break away, and finally to transcend. This is such a dynamic image. It reminds me of a Jackson Pollock or a Franz Klein. And I love the variety of marks here. They're these big, long swipes that are three or four feet long. There are spatters and there are paint trails and there are these droplets that seem to explode into a spray. And over there, there's a huge puddle of ink that hasn't even dried yet. It's amazingly exciting to look at, but this isn't simply about the image. It's about the action that produces the image. This is an art. Of the body, it's about discipline, about control, about movement. Calligraphy, of course, is an ancient art form, but in this room and on this paper, it couldn't be more alive. Today, most Japanese homes seem far removed from the country's graceful traditions. Everyday life may be ordered and peaceful, but it isn't particularly Japanese. Critics have claimed that people no longer care about preserving their native traditions. Here, at least in Kyoto, there are signs that one of Japan's everyday art forms is still being embraced. The kimono, Japan's national costume. But these people aren't locals, they're mostly Asian tourists who've paid vast sums of money to play act Japan's past. Over the past century, Japan has had to negotiate a tricky path. How to keep its heritage alive and relevant amidst the perpetual change of modern life. Since the 1950s, Japan's booming population transformed the way its citizens lived. It produced vast, sprawling cities across the country. Most of them formed without any planning to speak of. Much as we like to valorize the art of the Japanese home, Japan's rapid urbanization in the 20th century has made domestic life extremely challenging. In Tokyo, more than 6,000 people inhabit every square kilometer, and this has led to homes becoming smaller precisely as they become more expensive. Barely a month goes by without a story appearing in the press about young Tokyo workers living in apartments that aren't much larger than coffins.
Incredibly, the average Japanese home now only lasts for 30 years. Inheritance tax is so high that it's often cheaper to bulldoze the family home and start again. The relentless rebuilding of Japan in the post-war years has produced vast swathes of awful architecture and some really horrible homes. But it's also created opportunities. There are more architects per capita in Japan than in any other country in the world. And because of relaxed planning regulations and severely limited space, these architects have been able to take creative risks that aren't always possible elsewhere. And the humble home has become the ground zero of experimentation. All sharp edges, repeated forms and concrete walls. Even in the most sleepy neighbourhood, you'll stumble upon houses that seem to have crash-landed from the future. Or at least from some postmodernist textbook. Some have no windows, and others no walls. But there is method in this madness. Japanese cities can be aggressively ugly and messy places. And modern houses like this one are, I think, part of a fight against that. They're an attempt to make spaces that are beautiful and ordered and peaceful amid the seemingly endless urban chaos that surrounds them. They are, in many respects, a return to the ancient lessons of Zen, but crossbred with modern minimalism. In fact, what we might call Zenimalism has become a trademark of Japan's most famous architects, like Tadao Ando, Toyo Ito, and Kengo Kuma. They have established Zenimalism as a major national style of architecture and exported it to the rich and famous around the world. But though Zenimalism began with the rich, it soon reached everyone else. A number of companies began to commercialise the new aesthetic, packaging Japanese minimalism for the mass market. And the most successful of them all was Muji. Since 1980, Muji has been turning Zen into an off-the-peg commodity. This high street nirvana proved exceptionally successful. The company is now worth more than $2 billion and has nearly 700 stores around the world. Its famous name is an abbreviation of Mujirushi, which means no brand. Yet image is what Muji is all about. Its shops are decorated like luxury spas. Pointless appliances are deceptively functional. And products have clean lines and plain colours. The whole thing seems modern and international. But there are nods everywhere to ancient Japanese aesthetics. This is a revealing example of the Muji aesthetic a bag of stones. Now, there's nothing fancy about it. The stones themselves are perfectly unremarkable, and the packaging is almost comically restrained. No logo, no poetic description, just stone, written in Japanese, and then, of course, underneath in English. But though at first this seems like such a simple product, it is, in fact, full of references. It taps into these great old Japanese ideas about the mysteries of nature, about modesty and imperfection. And, of course, when you arrange these stones in a bowl in your home, you are continuing a tradition that goes all the way back to the great Zen rock gardens of the past. In much of its advertising, Muji offers up a timeless vision of the land of the rising sun. 
It also offers to bring the beauty of Zen into your home, provided you purchase its products. Many of us think that Muji epitomizes the Japanese aesthetic, that it's the product of an entire people who miraculously understand that less is more. But Muji isn't the real Japan, just like IKEA isn't the real Sweden, and Laura Ashley isn't the real Britain. The real Japan is anything but Zen. It's a place of urban clutter, exposed power cables, and small, messy homes. To understand these homes, I've come to an apartment block in the heart of Tokyo and to one of the great chroniclers and champions of contemporary Japanese life. Like half of all Tokyo dwellers, photographer and journalist Kyoichi Suzuki lives in a single-person apartment, where one space is used for several different functions – living, working, and sleeping. Not to mention storage. But Kyoichi is one of the lucky ones. It's not uncommon for a family of four to live in a space this size. It's a long way from the fantasy adverts of Muji. When a lot of Western people in particular think mm. of Japanese homes, they, mm. they think of tatami mats yeah. and shoji screen and zen and minimalism. Yeah. What do you think about that conception? Ah, uh, kind of embarrassing, I think, you know. It's just because we think a British lifestyle is like a Downton Abbey or something like that, you know. So it's not real at all. Or oh, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> fake news. <laughs> yeah. For over 25 years, Koichi has been tirelessly documenting the homes of Tokyo's youth. Until recently, you know, no one talks about uh, normal people, normal life. In Tokyo today, the average size of an apartment is 60 square metres, the equivalent of 36 tatami mats. For example, you know, this is a typical Tokyo apartment like you. So is this all one apartment? Yeah, it's all one apartment. Do you remember the person who lived here? Was it a student or...? He was a, he was a young uh, cartoon manga artist. You know, whenever I go to those apartments, I just told them, don't try to clean up, you know? Mm. I want to see as you live. Yes. I feel like I'm showing like a darker side of Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> In his seminal 1993 book, Tokyo, A Certain Style, Koichi photographed portraits of a hundred people, not by capturing their faces, but their flats. In doing so, he documented the lives of ordinary city dwellers who had been largely ignored. This is a house of a guy who is a music critic. No? You go into a small path, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a really old Japanese-style house, no? Really cheap. Wow, look at that. Oh, my yeah. gosh. So... He needs some more shelves, doesn't he? I know, I know. The shelf is already full, no? Yeah. So he has to just pile his new CDs all the time, no? But uh, what hap what's going to happen when he needs, like, uh, this one? Near the close <laughs> <to the> bottom. <laughs> you talk about empty space, there's that word ma. Ma, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You didn't see much of it in your travels? No, no. <laughs> there's no space for ma, I think. No space for space. No space for space, exactly. <laughs> To traditional critics, these homes epitomized all that was wrong with modern Japanese life. We forget that Zen attitude or philosophy, and uh, we lost our classic aesthetics and everything. So it was so negative point of view towards uh, modern life. 
and I wanted to change that. I met a young DJ wannabe. He lives in that、uh, four and a half tatami room. So this is all one room. Yeah, yeah, three meter square.、So、that is the, the entire、like、floor space. One, one meter. But you know, there is a famous saying in Zen that、uh, you need、uh, only a half tatami to meditate, no? only、uh, one tatami to sleep. So more than that is just a luxury. Koichi's work documents a fascinating urban phenomenon. Within the confines of tiny spaces, people have found remarkable freedom. Plundering east and west, old and new, their magpie aesthetic has produced a style that both is and isn't Japanese, and seems genuinely democratic. I mean, going into rich people's place is not interesting at all, you know, because it's same. It's not their lifestyle. It's a decorator's lifestyle, you know, or an architect's lifestyle. Because minimalism is to hide your personality. So I was, I was really into going to, you know, poor kids' apartments, <laughs> so, because that shows their lifestyle. There's no closet, you know. so you see the wall, you know, you see what they are wearing. Small places is a representation of、uh, people's life, everyday life. I think. In the course of my journey, I've discovered different types of Japanese home: traditional and modern, minimalist and maximalist. But in a remote and mountainous part of Nagano, one architect is building houses like no one else. His name is Terunobu Fujimori. Fujimori isn't a conventional architect. In fact, he only started designing buildings in his 40s, and he runs his practice, if we can call it a practice, like few others. For years, many of his projects were completed not by professionals, but by a gaggle of friends, including a novelist, a sake brewer, a publisher, and a priest. Now, it might sound like the start of a bad joke, but the results, when they came, were spectacular. On a small patch of land behind his house is one of his most bizarre creations. This is the flying mud boat house. Oh! One of Fujimori's fantastical tea houses. Wow! <laughs> so cosy in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is great. Great. <laughs> Have a cup of tea. Yeah.、Uh, this bowl is my favorite. This is your favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please. I get the. I get your favorite. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Delicious. Delicious. <laughs> Very strong. Yeah, too strong. <laughs> Fujimori's style may be eccentric, but it's grounded in some of Japan's oldest beliefs. Japan's Shinto is a spirit of nature. It's 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 a spirit of nature. 特にあの建築にとっても自然とこうあまり矛盾しないあるいは自然に溶け込むような建物を作るっていうことで私にとっても非常にあの浸透っていうのは影響を与えていると思います。Growing up in the countryside, Fujimori spent his childhood tending the trees in the nearby forest. But the trees provided more than timber. Childhood baseball, ball and bat. 
おもちゃというようなものはあんまりなかった。すべて木で作ったり、木を使って遊ぶ。ワン、ツー、スリー。おお、の。when Fujimori grew up, he didn't become an architect, but an eminent architectural historian. He might never have built a thing, but in 1989, he was asked by the people of his village to design a museum. Dedicated to an ancient Shinto shrine. それを現代の建築としてどう表現するかっていうのが一番のやっぱ難題でした。どの時代のどこにもないというそういうスタイルをまあ求めて。Inspired by the region's natural surroundings, Fujimori wanted to channel Japan's prehistoric past. His first building left most people baffled. あの私の親とかね、あの私の近所の人たちは、なんでこんな古臭い昔のようなものを作ったんだってとても否定的でした。But there were some sympathizers. Young architects of his generation, like Toyo Ito and Tadao Ando. 何をやろうとしているかは分からないけども何かこう大事なことのようだからこう,こういうことをもっとやったらどうかって進めてくれました Commissions weren't forthcoming so Fujimori designed a spectacular house for himself アンポポっていうのは最も日本で春の花として、えー、子供たちが好きなんですねでそのタンポポを壁と屋根に植えたいと思ったんです。当然のようにどっからも注文がない。それで自分家でやることにした。ダンダライアンハウス was the first in a series of buildings sprouting all manner of plant life. Leeks, grass, even trees. With these buildings, Fujimori hoped to bring nature back into Japanese homes. やはりこう現代の建築や都市には自然が少ないんですけども、それはあの良くないという。やはり人間はにとっては自然の素材とか自然、まあ土とか緑とか水っていうのが身近にあるってことが基本的に大事なことだと思います。現代の東京というのはものすごい勢いでまた変わり始めています。特にあのまあ超高層ビルがどんどん立ち始めているんですけれども、おそらくそういうものがたくさんこうできればできるほど、おそらく反対のもの、小さなものとか自然的なものっていうのが人間にとっては絶対に必要だと考えております。But Fujimori has created a high rise of his own. Though it looks like it was dreamed up by Lewis Carroll or Studio Ghibli. This is the Too High Tea House. Only 2.2 meters wide, this is a house on a truly human scale. The gilded lantern in the ceiling turns the whole place golden at sunset. And the window overlooks his beloved hometown and his first work of architecture.
Though this building belongs to a great Japanese tradition, it taps into something far more universal and far more human. And I love how personal this building is. I love the fact that it was tailored to the size of Fujimori's own body. I love the fact that he built it with his friends. And I love the fact that as you look out over the various views around it, you can see the mountains that he loved so much. You can see his family home, the plot of land on which he was born. Though this building is small, it encapsulates so much of Fujimori's life. You know, climbing up here and crawling inside was like a return to childhood. It was like a regression to the womb. And I think Fujimori is reminding us that for all of our talk of houses and apartments and palaces, for all of our talk of modernism and minimalism, and for all those aspirations we have about additional bedrooms and ensuite bathrooms, that ultimately and originally, a home is a place of shelter. It's about making a safe haven to call one's own. This series has explored Japan's rich and complex culture a culture that has been shaped by the outside world, but is unlike any other. In the process, I've seen exceptional works of art, from its old masterpieces to its modern installations, its tranquil gardens to its exuberant art forms. But in the course of my travels, I found art in more than just artworks. I found beauty in landscapes, the seasons, in people's homes, and above all, in their lives. One of the things I've noticed here over and over again is the artfulness of people. There's a precision and elegance in so much of what they do. Japan, of course, is a complex and challenging place, and not all of it is beautiful. But it does seem to me to be a culture that has for centuries cared profoundly about detail, about getting the little things right. And that is why even in the most ordinary places, beauty can usually be found. <laughs> 